Hi, I'm Tom Marino. At Cone Resnick, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Meridian Health, Taking Care of New Jersey, Felician College, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Cone Resnick, Accounting, Tax and Advisory, where forward thinking creates results, Investors Bank, the New Jersey Education Association, and by the Ohlendorf Center. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I mean, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. I am Steve Adubato. Welcome to the Tisch WNET studio here in the heart of uh, Manhattan. Chef Danielle Balut, thank you so much for joining us. Does anyone else ever mispronounce your last name? Yes, but it's okay, as long as they spell Danielle right. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me about the foundation, it's the Mentor Foundation, right? That you are yes. the chair of? So, yes, absolutely. With uh, Thomas Keller and Jerome Bocuse and myself, we established the Mentor Foundation. And it's really about uh, uh, raising uh, first education to young chef to really help young chef to have the chance to get grants to be able to uh, Those are colleagues right there yes well voilà, absolutely and uh, to have, have a chance to um, support young chef in their continuing education which is very important and uh, so we have competition we have made a national uh, uh, we have made a national call of young chefs, and they are between 22 and 27. And they will be competing in four different cities. We have uh, New York, we have Miami, we have New Orleans, we have uh, San Francisco or Los Angeles. Uh, That's wonderful. And, and uh, those young chefs will have to do a, um, a competition with the protein and three garnish, two hours to compete and serve eight people. and the. Uh, the eight uh, judge are part of the Culinary Council of Mentor, who is about 40 to 50 of the best American chef. Let me ask you, um, I often ask uh, actors and, and, and authors and, and scholars and others when they knew that they wanted to do a particular thing mm -hmm. or be in a particular field, when did you know that you wanted to be in this field? I think when I, um, I started cooking at 14. 14? And yes, 14. Where? In Lyon, in the heartland of cooking, I would say, in sort of the crater of cuisine in France. And um, at 17, I knew it, and that's what I wanted to do. And I wanted to work for the best chef I could work for. And that's what I did for five, seven years, where I uh, worked with some of the greatest chefs in France. And I think it was about being mentored. And the Mentor Foundation is about today inspiring young chefs to choose their mentor well. And if they don't have the chance to work for a great mentor and their great cook, to at least have the opportunity to stage and to be able to travel maybe the world and, and, and spend time in a restaurant where they, you know, they, get a, they get a grant for that and mm. we pay them uh, three months in Europe uh, in one of the finest restaurants just to continue their education. And I think as a, for me as a young chef, it's all about being well mentored. It's about mentoring essentially because you had the opportunity to be mentored and you want to make sure you pass that on clearly. Very much. When did you come to New York? Oh, I came in the early 80s, so I had the chance to see already three decades of growing talent and nurturing young talent in America. And I think Thomas Keller is the same way. We were working together in 1983 at the Westbury Hotel on Madison Avenue. <laughs> and we have been very close and very committed to not only education, but inspiring young chefs. So there is a competition. Mentor is a, an umbrella in a way of 
taking care of many things besides grants and also scholarship. We want also, we manage a competition called Bocus d'Or. And Bocus d'Or USA, it's like the Olympic Bocus of cooking. Bocus d'Or? Bocus d'Or, yes. Uh, before you go any further, we actually, uh, Paul, do we have any video of that? Let's show some video of Bocus d'Or. Yes. Unless we'll talk about it. Let's go to the video. Un plat japonais absolument magnifique. What were we just looking at? That's, that well, was wild. That was a glimpse into the competition. This is happening every two years in Lyon, and Paul Bocuse himself, 25 years ago, decided to create the Olympic of cooking. The Olympics of cooking? Yes, in a way, and there's 45 countries uh, entering, and only 24 will compete in Lyon uh, from all over the world. And, uh, and this is the most uh, challenging and the most rewarding competition. We support this competition because we believe that this is about inspiring, this is about maturing, but it's right. also about making greater chef and showing to the world that America have the finest chef as well. Now, in your restaurants, I'm curious about this. How, do you, how much of a role do you take in leading and managing as opposed to cooking? Well, it's a daily role of cooking and managing. I don't cook everything from scratch. I cannot cook everything on the menu either, but I choose to sometimes work side by side with certain cooks on the stations. You have seven restaurants in New York. Well, yeah, I have many kitchens to watch, <laughs> but I have also an executive team helping me into that. Of now, what course. are we looking at right there? This is Danielle. And uh, this is the, um, this is the uh, restaurant where I oh, on 65th I'm a home base. Yes, yeah. absolutely. That's your home base? That's my home base. I live right above the store, and I work. Uh, my office is there as well. well. And what are we looking at there? Uh, the dining room. The dining room. And it's quite a. Do you have a hand in setting. the design as well? Of course, I'm involved. I think, like every chef, we are involved in every detail every of the detail. experience to the guest. Every detail of the experience to the guest. Of course. At the end, everything we do, it's about making sure that the guest uh, feel uh, the commitment. Uh, the talent, the care, and, and really the, the personality of uh, one's chef. Before I let you out of here, I want to ask you this question. Are you a fan of <laughs> many of the reality cooking shows? Well, I can tell you that cooking reality show are inspiring, cooking reality show entertaining, but they are not the reality of our business. And I think if anyone dreamed to become a great chef one day, I don't think it should start with TV. It should really start with finding a good mentor. I think that is the most important thing. Finding a good mentor, it don't matter if it's a small, a small restaurant mm. or a big restaurant, as long as the chef is committed to quality, is committed to excellence and is committed to teach someone to be a good chef. Well, Danielle, I want to thank you for um, letting us understand more about the reality of being a chef as opposed to uh, what other people think. And if anyone wants to know more, of course, they can go online at Mentor. Uh, we had your website BKB, up. Yeah, right, absolutely. Right there. We have it voilà. up the whole time. And, and that will give you all the information of the goal we try to really accomplish with that. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank Stay you very right much, there. Steve. Thank you. Uh, this is One on One. We're at Lincoln Center. We'll be right back right after this. To see more One on One with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. That's from uh, Kinky Boots, Billy Porter, Tony 
award-winning actor from Kinky Boots. By the way, for those who don't know the story behind Kinky Boots, describe it. Um, oh, wow. I haven't been asked that in a while. So it's Not about... Not everybody knows! <laughs> yes, it's about a shoe factory in Northampton, England, that's going under, and um, our unlikely hero, Charlie Price, um, is sort of thrust into, um, you know, being the leader and decides to save the factory mm. by making high-heeled shoes for men. Yeah. After meeting my character. And your character? Is a, a drag queen named Lola. Lola. Yes. What's Lola like? <laughs> Lola is fabulous. Lola is sassy. <laughs> Lola is very smart. And Lola is very talented. How high are the heels that Lola wears? Oh, they're anywhere between four to six inches. What's it like to uh, perform? Well, it's an extraordinary play, but, but what's it like to perform in the heels? Challenging at all? Well, you know, there's a little, there's a little mini me in the show that starts the show, a little, a young Lola, and you see him putting on high heels and sort mm. of prancing around at an early age. That that was me. I was the I was the little kid that was, you know, stealing my aunt's high heel shoes out of that the was closet. you. Yeah, that was me. So I was walking around in high heel shoes for a, for a while. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, you know, the difficult part about it was the stamina to keep them on. I was gonna say. Yeah, that was that was where the the challenge came. So what do you got, like work out in high heels and, and build up that stamina? What's up uh, with that? I actually I actually went to Bikram Yoga um, to sort of train my and try to strengthen my core. Because what generally happens very often is that people's backs go out because of the the infrastructure of the heel and what it does mm. to your to your body. So I wanted to strengthen my core mm. so that I could have the stamina to do the show. This 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 show, um, so many interesting themes. What resonates for you in Kinky Boots? Um, the biggest theme is the understanding that we can only be the best version of ourselves. Mm. You know, no matter what that means. So, you know, just be who you ought to be, never let them tell you. Just be who you want to be, never let them tell you who you ought to be. Mm. And that's something that's really powerful for me as a, you know, as a black gay man in this world. It's very, um, it's a powerful sentiment um, that seems really easy, but I always think, you know, I always say it's, it's easy to be who you are when what you are is what's popular. Um, that's easy. That's, it's easy to be who you are what when what Pittsburgh you are up? is what's popular. It was not very easy. Um, it wasn't a popular thing to be who I am. Um, so I love that sentiment about the show. And I also love you can change the world when you change your mind. And, um, you know, that's the message that we get to put out into the world. That's the gift we get to share with people every day. Well, when you were uh, growing up in Pittsburgh, what opportunities were there for you to perform? Oh, I had amazing opportunities in Pittsburgh. Where? Pittsburgh in the in the uh, 80s, 70s and 80s was, and still is, um, you know, sort of a cultural, um, a, a cultural center, you know, and it's surprising to a lot of people yeah, because you don't, they, they you, don't, you, don't, you don't associate Pittsburgh with that kind of thing, but the culture in Pittsburgh is amazing. There were lots of, um, government-funded um, cultural things that young kids could participate in and get lots of training for free, whether it was music classes or voice lessons or dance classes or, you know, writing class. I mean, there was everything was at your fingertips. That was there for you. Yeah, it was really what there for What about the me. rest of your life outside of those opportunities? Outside Challenging? Of, uh, well, yeah. I mean, How it was... So? It was challenging in the sense that I grew up in a very religious, uh, Pentecostal religious household and... Um, accepting? Yeah, it was just really difficult. You not know, accepting? To, not accepting not. at all. Not accepting, no. And it was really difficult to navigate that at that age. It was a very difficult time. Um, but I did have the arts and it saved my life. Came to New York when? Uh, well, I started coming to New York when I was in college. Uh, the 
sophomore year, my sophomore year of college, I would come up and spend the summers. I officially moved on January, I'm, not, I'm sorry, December 27th, 1990. How do you know the date? Because I moved, it was the second semester of my senior year of college, and I moved to be the, in the original company of Miss Saigon. Wow. So it was... What was that like for you? It was remarkable. I mean, it's the, it's the dream. It was my dream from the time I was 11 years old. So to perform To be on Broadway. Here? That was it. Yeah, so to, so to move here with my very first job being in one of the most talked about shows of that era was, was they, breathtaking. They, they, wanted, they wanted you. Yes, it was pretty breathtaking. It had to be amazing. And you, yeah. Tony. Uh, well, I didn't win a Tony for that. They won the Tony. Mm, no, they didn't win the Tony for that either. The actors won the for, Tonys. The, the show did not win the Tony. When you won the Tony for Kinky Boots, what's that like? <laughs> well, it's a really surreal moment. You know, I mean, I... Like I said, I, I've had the dream since I was 11. Um, since you were 11? Since I was 11. But okay. as, you, as you grow and as you mature, you know, for me at least, I had moved away from the necessity for that kind of validation in terms of, you know, gauging what my success is. Um, but the Tony's the Tony. But the Tony is the Tony. You know, and when you win it, it's like... There's not that many. <laughs> it's, no, there's not that many at all, and it's just kind of... It's life-changing. It really is... Life-changing. It's life-changing. It really is life-changing. One example? Um, <laughs> well, okay, it, put, seems put as though, it seems as though my opinion matters again. You're a playwright. So. While, I, uh, <laughs> yet while I Yet Live. Yes. At the Duke Theater on 42nd Street. Yes. Right? Yes. Real quick, give, give that, us a description. It's, it's a play about my family and growing up in Pittsburgh. Um, it's a coming-of-age <laughs> story about growing up black, gay, and Christian um, in Pittsburgh. Um, and I don't know that that play would have been able to have been done. If you had without, not won? If I had not. You know, the, the, the Tony has thrust me into the hearts and minds of people who are now interested in hearing more. So that's been a gift. Well, we encourage people to go check out uh, While I Yet Live and also see uh, Kinky Boots, Billy Porter, yes. a Tony Award winning actor. I want to thank you for joining us on Public Broadcasting. Thank you. Thanks Appreciate for having me. And by the way, who's the designer again? Wu Young Me. One, one word. word. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Billy. Appreciate it. Thank you. Stay right there. Stay with us. We'll be right back one on one right after this. Thank you very much. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. My wife. What, Maddie? You're going with the delegation to Afghanistan, right, G.J.? Why would I do that, Maddie? Because a full brigade of North Carolina guards rotated over there last week. So what? They know I support them. I'll make a video. Kill John, everything has changed. Changed how changed? Taylor had another stroke last night. He withdrew from the race. What? That, that's good. Well, not for him, obviously, but... Now, that's an outstanding development. Wrong, honey bear. Guess who just announced he's running? Who? Digger Man Cusey. Huh? You're in a real race now, darling. You can't just sit in your little man cave anymore waiting to be reelected. That's a scene from uh, Alpha House. Co-executive producer, my good friend Jonathan Alter, who's also an NBC analyst. Good to see you, buddy. Good to see you, Steve. And now that was season one, season yeah. two. That was the beginning of season one, and we're now 21 episodes uh, into uh, Alpha House and uh, picking up a lot of new viewers all the time because people are are just kind of getting accustomed to the fact that Amazon is now in the original content business uh, and this was Amazon this is Amazon's first show and they now have you know several that are that are uh, on the air although I'm not mm. sure if he's calling them on the air since it's you can find them. video is quite quite the 
create the right description. And John, do me a favor. Describe for folks who don't know what uh, Alpha, House, Alpha House is. Yeah. Describe it. So uh, as you can see, it stars John Goodman, and he is one of four Republican senators who live in a townhouse, a kind of a man cave, frat house, on Capitol Hill. Who are the uh, others? The, uh, the others are, are played by Mark Consuelos, uh, who some people might Kelly remember. Kelly Ripa's... Kelly Ripa's husband, right. yeah. Uh, Clark Johnson, uh, an actor and director who was in uh, the last season of The Wire. He kind of dominated as the uh, the newspaper editor in The Wire. Yep. And, and Matt Malloy, uh, six feet under, a uh, wonderful comic actor. And then we have, uh, you know, we have Bob Balaban, uh, Wanda Sykes, the two of them play Democratic senators, and they, you know, interact with our, our Republicans. It's kind of roughly based on where Senator Schumer and Senator Durbin and some others live on Dick Capitol Durbin. Hill. Dick Durbin. They live on Capitol Hill now, um, except we changed them from Democrats <laughs> to Republicans because Republicans are a little funnier nowadays. Republicans are funnier? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So when Gary Trudeau, who's the creator yes. of this, when he did... Uh, Tanner 88. Yes, uh, I remember Robert Tanner Altman, yeah. uh, in the, in the 80s. That time he was satirizing Democrats. They their party was kind of in crisis and uh, they were more interesting and now it's the Republicans who don't know how to deal with this Tea Party challenge. So in the clip you just saw, the guy who's running against him is a, a, a tea, tea Party, party candidate. Oh. So so John Goodman Worst plays, nightmare. He plays a <laughs> he plays a retired uh, UNC basketball coach. He's a senator from North Carolina, and his challenger is the current Duke basketball coach. Oh, uh, talk about a rivalry! So, so there, yeah. Anyway, that's but that's um, that's good stuff. That's just at the very beginning of of our first season, and we now they've gone through a whole set of other uh, other adventures, and uh, we How have. You love doing this. It's just a really nice change of pace for me, Steve. And and you know, it, one of the things that's been fun is we've gotten some real senators in it. So we had some cameos, Schumer, right? Schumer some in of the season cameos. one, and then Chuck Schumer. Yeah, and then this season we have uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren and Senator John McCain. Uh, we also have uh, former Governor Ed Rendell of from Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania, but he plays himself running for the Senate against one of our characters oh, this is great. from Pennsylvania. And, um, you know, he has uh, what ends up being a, a close race with uh, uh, Senator Betancourt, who's played by Clark Jones. And some of your journalistic yeah. colleagues are in it as well. A lot. Uh, we have... Cameos uh, by... cameos. Well, everybody from, you know, Tom Brokaw, George Stephanopoulos, Gary's wife, Jane Pauley. She interviews Bill Murray... Uh, who plays a senator who had to move out of the house because he was taken to jail. And so he <laughs> makes a cameo in the first episode of season one, and then in the first episode of season two, he's interviewed in an orange jumpsuit and a, a do-rag from, from jail where the uh, disgraced senator is. And then uh, David Axelrod is in it, and, and Penn Jillette, the uh, magician. Penn Jillette. So he, he's the Democratic candidate for the Senate from Nevada against our senator, uh, uh, you know, who's from, who's from Nevada, Senator Laffer. So, and Senator Laffer, uh, is, uh, his wife is played by Amy Sedaris, who is a, a, an actress that yes. you know, an awful lot of people like. Again, tell folks where they can find this. Uh, it's on Amazon. You need to subscribe to Amazon Prime, which gives you the free shipping, free two-day uh, shipping, and then you get... Uh, well, on October 24th, yeah. uh, we're binge releasing yeah. all 10 episodes of the second season. You can watch uh, before, uh, you know, we, we did binge release it all on October 24th. Uh, and you can actually uh, see the first season uh, pretty much anytime, anytime you want if you subscribe to Amazon. Last time we uh, sat down with Jonathan uh, from one on one, uh, we were talking about uh, his most recent book called. The center holds Obama and his enemies. All right, before uh, I let you out here, I got like a minute and a half. Uh, Give me a minute and a half on Obama, where we are. So it's it's really amazing what has changed in the last few months since he was giving commencement addresses and, yep. and uh, you know threading a very careful kind of non-interventionist path, taking pride in the fact. Uh, that he would be remembered as the president. As the center ended, held, John. Ended two wars. Oh, the center definitely held. The reason the book's called The Center Holds is because uh, the 2012 election, which is what that book covers, 
uh, was about Plugging whether your this, book. Is that okay? Yes. We got love it. Screen. Was about whether the country was going to yeah. shift dramatically to the right. As he held. And, and uh, he's, uh, you know, in trouble, but I, uh, in some trouble politically, obviously. Uh, you know, things have not been going well for his party. Um, but um, I think that uh, history will see him as a good, though uh, probably not a great president, not a, you know, not in the first rank. But I think if you actually look in a, in a very clear-eyed way mm. at what he accomplished, particularly in the first two years when he accomplished in that period more than, say, Bill Clinton did in eight years, if you just look at the scorecard of, of things that, that took place, uh, he stacks up, he'll stack up well. And I actually think on foreign policy, uh, he's not, you know, playing John Wayne, but he is, and he's not, uh, nobody likes this war. Does he seem like he loves but his I, job still? John, uh, come on. He's never loved the job. That's, that's the, one of the paradoxes of Barack Obama that I explore in the center hold. He is a, an enormously successful politician. Doesn't love the job. He got reelected got over 50% of the vote okay. twice for the first time since Eisenhower. That's political success, but he does not like politics. Uh, but we like Jonathan Alter, yeah. co-executive producer, Alpha House, and uh, analyst from NBC. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks a lot. Everybody. Great to see you, stuff. Steve. Talk about a shift from that to Alpha it's House. It's just a nice change. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Meridian Health, Felician College, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Cone Resnick, Investors Bank, the New Jersey Education Association, and by the Ollendorf Center. Promotional support provided by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey, and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and its monthly magazine, New Jersey Business. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. I started feeling this pressure in my chest. The doctors and the nurses that were attending to me, that they were of such excellence. They were wonderful. You know, they, they put my mind at ease. I owe my life to them. I, I, I don't think I really would be here if it was, wasn't for them. Because of the way they handled everything, um, I think that's really why I'm here. I felt that I was in good hands.